Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Peter Rumanier. I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Jim Rumanier is one of eight children and my twin brother. He is a, an accomplished newspaper person, having worked for 43 years in Baltimore, Washington, and for many years in Keene, New Hampshire, where he was president of the Keene Sentinel. What he will be talking about is a preoccupation of his since his retirement in 2013. What inland waters mean to us and what we mean to it. How our life changes around the world. Jim, thank you very much. Thank you so much. It is quite a thrill to be introduced by one's twin brother in events such as this. It's also a thrill to be in, in the room with our, with our older brother, John, an accomplished writer who has also has previously spoken at the uh, bookstock. Uh, and of course, their spouses and my wife and my granddaughter, we have a whole family affair here. <clears throat> in 2012, my uh, tiny town uh, of Roxbury, New Hampshire, celebrated its bicentennial. The town's first uh, distinction was that of uh, hosting several small mills. And then later in the 19th century, uh, it took to quarrying granite, and it was valued granite uh, widely, uh, used in bridges, buildings as far away as Albany, New York. And then it's modern distinction. Those, the mill operations and the granite quarrying are no longer, but its latest distinction is that of being one of the greenest towns around. In a bicentennial commemorative booklet, I wrote about how three uh, bodies of water in town, that's two drinking water reservoirs for a nearby city, and also a federal flood control dam, how those watershed protections assure that thousands and thousands of acres in the town would never be developed. Hence, here was water defining the character of the town. I thought afterwards, well, if water can define, can define, influence, define a uh, community by keeping it green, what else could it do? What else could it mean in our lives? Hence, the title of the book, Water Connections. There are so many of these connections. You know, going way back, our, our first uh, 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 settlements were built on the banks of uh, rivers and streams so as to generate power to turn logs into lumber and, and grain into flour. But other, other, uh, other connections uh, evolve. We've contaminated water, we've cleaned up water, we've dammed rivers, we've taken dams down. We've used uh, water, water for agriculture. We've been flooded by water, we've boated on it, we've fished in it, we've drawn inspiration from it. I came upon these and other connections by reading a great many books from the 19th century, early 20th century. But most of my research was conducted in the field. Um, in places such as the water treatment plant in Keene, New Hampshire, which eight years ago was outfitted with a form of hydro technology that was unimaginable a mere decade earlier. I inspected wild streams that had been bulldozed into lifeless gutters, and I met people who were trying to undo the damage. I visited MIT, where I followed three uh, graduate students uh, who had invented a water-saving device as they took that device through various competition, winning thousands of dollars along the way, and then preparing themselves to take that invention into the marketplace to make a business of it. I and my wife scrambled along the banks of the Deerfield River, looking for a wild orchid whose protection owed to a monumental change in the regulation and licensing of uh, hydropower dams in the 1980s that required hydropower operators to devote as much attention to their impact on the environment as to how much power they generated. And I took in, in a wastewater treatment plant, I, I took in and, and, and met a, a worker there who sings about sewers in the manner of Bruce Springsteen. So you can see there, <laughs> there were a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, adventures in this research of the book. 
extremely stimulating, and from them I drew several lessons. One is that with all the possibilities of pollution around us, frankly, we ought to consider ourselves considerably lucky that we don't have more problems with our water. Lesson number two, big solutions sometimes can come from many small steps. I know of a couple of cities in New England which, in anticipation of rising demand for water, either planned to spend or, in fact, in one case, did spend immense amounts of money to develop supplementary sources of water, only to find out that those projections never materialized, never came to be. Why? A variety of reasons. Uh, factories, uh, factories, manufacturing plants gradually left the economy. But another important uh, distinction, another important change was the um, requirement in the Energy Policy Act of 1992 that builders install water efficient appliances in homes. Hence, uh, water efficient shower heads, water efficient low flow toilets. That's 1.5 gallons per flush versus 3.6. Doesn't sound like a lot, but when you add up all the flushes in the day, you're saving a lot of water. Lesson number three, floods are acts of God, but flood losses are largely acts of man. I wish I had made that up, but that comes from an ecologist in the, in the mid-20th century who observed that we cause many of our own problems by what we do to land and near land around streams and rivers. And lesson number four, is that history is as much about what doesn't happen as what does. And what better place to raise that thought than in this facility, this historical society in Woodstock. Now this presentation has several parts. I'll describe an event that did not happen. I'll have a few words about unintended consequences. I'll bring up some recent, recent changes in our ways and practices around inland waters. And I'll end with a salute to the ordinary citizens, so many of them who have worked so hard over the last century, but largely in the last couple of decades, to look out for our waters. And finally, I'll be happy to take questions and um, exchange your, your experiences around water um, at the end. First, an event that did not happen. In the early decades of the 20th century, there were a significant number of major floods. In this particular state, the flood of, of 1927 is still remembered. And in the 1930s, Congress called for action, a defensive action. The idea was, uh, was infrastructure. It was building more dams. And that idea was based in part on the success or perceived success of the Tennessee Valley Authority, an early project of the uh, Roosevelt administration that not only controlled floods, but had other applications that generated power, provided irrigation, provided recreation. But the idea of installing scores of flood control dams that were equipped with hydroelectric facilities in New England did not receive a warm reception here. And by that I mean, when I say New England, I'm meaning mainly the two states of Vermont and New Hampshire where the, all those dams would be built, largely for the benefit of Hartford and all those cities south of here, Massachusetts and Connecticut. This was the time when Republicans dominated the political landscape in New England, northern New England generally and northern New England in particular which may be a revelation to some young Vermonters these days. There was a resistance to the idea of big government. One material fear was that these huge dams would flood out local lands. Therefore, other, those lands which otherwise could go for, for tax-paying vacation homes, and again, serve only the needs of folks who lived in uh, cities south of the, these northern states. In January 1939, just before Franklin Roosevelt ordered federal workers 
to start scouting out dam sites up here in Vermont. The Vermont legislature put the equivalent of $1.2 million into a defense fund to block federal purchases of land in the state. In New Hampshire, Governor Francis Murphy threatened to call out the National Guard if agents from the federal government came looking to buy land. He told a gathering of New England governors, the states will never surrender to the federal government even if God's child is president, the title to our natural resources. Those are dramatic times. Then this too, some plans called for distributing electricity from these dams to electric power monopolies, which, which were not a, uh, locals up here weren't all that fond of them. Those power monopolies were controlled by people in states in southern New England. And they had refused to string wires to farmers in Vermont and New Hampshire and therefore leaving them at a disadvantage to farmers in other parts of New England, other parts of the country that had electric refrigeration. George Aiken, a Vermont berry par farmer in the early stages of a prominent political career said of power monopolies and floods, of the two evils, occasional floods seem preferable. <laughs> Ultimately, the idea of a northern TVA faded as the New Deal lost support and World War II came along. Ultimately, only 13 federal flood control dams got built, one of them in my town, and none on the Connecticut River, and none equipped with power generation. A good outcome or not so? If the TVA North plan had gone through There'd be a lot more land in Vermont and New Hampshire underwater today than now exists. And there'd be a lot more cars with Army Corps of Engineer insignia on the doorway than perhaps, and perhaps fewer farm tractors on the roads, meaning the character of the region would have been altered. Maybe you might say lost. Then again, if the dams had been built as planned, New England might not be importing 15% of its energy today. It might not have the highest electric costs in the nation. It might even be exporting electricity, an alternative of no small economic consequence. As Robert Frost might have put it, the road not taken has made all the difference. Now, a word about unintended consequences. One of the animating quotes of my book which right here and lots of copies over there for you comes from George Perkins Marsh of Woodstock in his 19th century classic uh, man and nature he lamented the quote collateral and unsought consequences of human action referring specifically to how lumber barons were stripping hillsides bare leaving erosion to send silt into rivers filling the rivers and causing floods far downstream. Now we commonly think of unintended consequences in a negative way. But there are cases where the opposite can exist. Here's one such case. It's about how water played a role in the federal acquisition and permanent preservation of 25 million acres of open space east of the Mississippi, including the Green Mountain National Forest. Environmentalists in the room will know the name of the law that authorized all that acquisition. It was the Federal Weeks Act of 1911, named after a New Hampshire native who represented Massachusetts in the Congress. The law came to be thanks to citizens in New Hampshire and also in Appalachian regions who were upset over what these logging barons were doing to the hills, laying waste to scenic areas, stripping the hillsides bare, leading to fires, a mess. These citizens lacked the money to buy the land away from the lumber barons, so they turned to Washington for help. Now, this is the first decade of the 20th century. The federal government at that time there were lots of big federal parks and forests, but they were all west of the Mississippi. And in almost every case, they weren't bought 
by the federal government. They were merely carved out of lands that the government had already claimed. And in most cases, when you read the works, the histories, those lands were set aside as parks because they had no commercial value, no minerals, no forests, no grazing land for, for livestock. So you can imagine that the initial reaction in Washington was not all that warm. Not one cent for a scenery, barked the Speaker of the House. But the Speaker and the full Congress eventually relented, thanks to Congressman John Weeks, who found a source of authority in a Supreme Court decision 90 years earlier that had nothing to do with land conservation at all. Rather, the, ca the case had to do with commerce on water. Thematically, it illustrated the unplanned co connectedness of historical events. In grade school, we all learned about Robert Fulton, the father of steamboat travel. He owes his, that credit, that distinction, in part to a monopoly on Hudson River travel that he had been able to wrest from the New York State Legislature. Now, competitors eventually sued, saying, we have a right to those rivers, too. It went all the way up to the Supreme Court, and the uh, competitors were represented by New Hampshire's Daniel Webster, who won a unanimous ruling in 1824 that the Commerce Clause of the U.S. Constitution, which until that time it was, has, had been called into play only to resolve tax disputes between states, <laughs> that the Commerce Clause involves commerce on navigable waters. Those words are in the decision. Fast forward to 1911, when Congressman John Weeks of Massachusetts came up with an argument that the rivers that were being silted up and ruined by the harvesting practices of the lumber barons were navigable waters, and therefore qualified for federal protection. He later explained, we had to find a constitutional reason, and the constitutional reason which we finally seized upon was the relation between forestry and stream flow. And what better way to protect that stream flow than to buy up all the lands in the watersheds of those rivers? The government had a constitutional authority to buy those lands. The court ruling in 1824, Gibbons versus Ogden, in case you're interested, had many other influences over American government and society. The Civil Rights Act of 1964, for example, was, was, was a product of that particular ruling. Obamacare, in fact, owes part of its strength, such as it is at this moment, to that ruling in 1824. But the point here is that these were steps and developments that were surely not understood or anticipated at the time of the ruling. But for the purposes of this book and this discussion, the role of water in protecting millions of acres of land was truly special. Some would say that that ruling was pernicious, represented pernicious overreach. It took the law where it should not have gone. But that has not proved to be a successful argument, merely a complaint. Here was a case of water having an influence over land thanks to a court decision that, a, a, that, 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 that was announced, that was developed 90 years before the Weeks Act of 1911. Now, a word about our changing ways around water. When I set out on this project, I thought, what new could there possibly be? We've been living around water for eons. After all, what, what, what what possibly new could there be? Well, in fact, much of what appears in the book occurred in the last 50 years, and many, much of it also occurred only in the last couple of decades. Most of the people in this room no doubt can remember that we used to send raw sewage straight into rivers. We don't do that anymore. We can also remember when we were instructed to uh, flush unused prescription medicines down the toilet. That's not there anymore. We can also remember when builders and developers would fill in or pave over wetlands. There are laws against doing that today. More recently, I came upon 
fresh worries or fresh changes, changes or new concerns. For example, worries about terrorists putting something toxic and worse into our waters, as recently as 2013, a case involving the waters of Quabbin Reservoir, the major supply of water for the city of Boston. Throughout New England, I met people who were trying to bring back fish migrations that people in previous decades had blocked. And in lakes everywhere, I found citizens working to keep invasive weeds from choking local waters. These invasive weeds weren't there 20 years ago. I also found new thinking about our ways and practices and laws and regulations around water. Long ago, nature was ours to subdue. Rivers were ours to re-engineer, to straighten, to confine. In this state, Vermont, parts of 70%, that's 70% of the rivers, have one way or another been straightened and channelized. The reasons made sense at the time. Surveyors of roads and railroads prefer straight lines, not meandering routes. And the people who used to float logs down rivers to sawmills, they preferred straight rivers, not curving ones where logs get stuck. And these people who straightened rivers and re-engineered them, re them had help along the way, including the chemical company DuPont. In the 1930s, it advertised a 48-page book that was elegantly titled Ditching with Dynamite that offered the following advice. Crooked streams are a menace to life and crops in orders in areas bordering their banks. The twisting and turning of the channel retards the flow and reduces the capacity of the stream to handle large volumes of water. Floods result. Crops are ruined. Lives are lost. Banks are undermined, causing cave-ins that steal valuable acreage. Dynamite may be the most useful, effective, may, may be used most effectively in taking out the kinks in a crooked stream. Well, now we know that water in straightened streams moves faster than it does in meandering streams, which can mean bad things for people who live down there, downstream. We know, too, that rivers that are cut off from the surroundings can do serious damage. And here's an example from Tropical Storm Irene in 2011. It has to do with Otter Creek. Otter Creek is the longest river that's in contained entirely within the state of Vermont. It flows north from, from down near Bennington up through Rutland, and then 30 miles later to Middlebury, and then into Lake Champlain. In August 2011, Rutland was hit with a terrific flood, historic floods from Otter Creek. After washing through Rutland, Otter Creek headed 30 miles downstream to Middlebury, where one could expect that the damage would be even worse. Yet, Middlebury hardly felt the storm. Why? The answer is in what lay between these two communities, the Otter Creek swamps. Not all swamps, but soft lands. The water having leaving, leaving left Rutland overflowed the banks of, the, of Otter Creek, flowed into the swamps that sucked them up like a sponges, and then gradually released them. The peak of the flood in Middlebury came more than a week after it had in Rutland. Lessons were learned from that. One of them is that it can be quite, you can save quite a bit of money if you can find ways to prevent floods from taking over a community. There was a, a um, study conducted by the University of Vermont shortly after Tropical Storm Irene that showed that the city saved um, at a minimum $2 million in damages as a result of the contribution from the Otter Creek swamps. I'm no hydrologist. Maybe some of you are. But you can see a big difference here. And it is a lesson to many people in Vermont that the lessons should be applied to their lands today. Vermont, as a result today, has some of the most advanced river science, river regulations uh, of any other state in the nation. And uh, you can Google it, Flood Ready Vermont, 
and you'll see some conversation there in standards that you won't find in other parts of the country. It's against the law <coughs> to do the sorts of things that used to be done to rivers. The key lesson is that rivers are connected to the lands around them. And the supporting lesson is that what we do on or to those lands also connects us to those rivers, not just here, but miles downstream. Now, I'm going to close with a few words about the most inspiring part of this book, one that I didn't expect when I got into it, and that's the role of ordinary citizens who look out for water through literally thousands of nonprofit associations and watershed coalitions and river councils across the nation. We are told by sociologists that Americans are receding from the public square. They're not running for the PTA. They're not running for local office. But here they are forming watershed councils, river associations, pulling weeds out of rivers in almost abandon. Not only, and not only that, they are, they are lobbying for clean water funds and the enforcement of clean water laws. All this activity is apparently part of our DNA. Nearly 200 years ago, Alexa de Tocqueville, the traveling French observer, picked up on the tendency to action by citizens. Uh, paraphrasing him a bit, he said, at the beginning of any undertaking in France, you'll see the government in control. And in England, you'll see a great lord in charge. In America, however, you'll find citizens and citizen groups getting things done. The question now that citizens and citizens associations, including those who fought, who fought the fight that led to the passage of the Weeks Act, the question is whether they have it in them to take on the challenges that are bigger than anyone they've already faced. By that I mean doing something about the rising incidents of downpours, hard storms that result from climate change. Northern New England faces greater increases in such storms than any other parts of the country. And at the same time, or are they capable of getting worked up and being effective in getting the government to lay some new regulations on all the chemicals that wind up in our water? In the research, I came upon a uh, agency called the Chemical Abstract Service, a unit of the chemical industry, that in the 1970s had determined that there was a limit to how many chemicals we could actually invent. And they predicted in the 1970s that the maximum number of chemicals that would ever be invented would be 7 million. Well, we have now more than 50 million chemicals in our environment, most of them unregulated, very few of them of which, about which we know their impact on the, the life of rivers and what live in, live in them. So are citizens ape capable of the next challenges? I certainly hope so. Now at the outset, I traced the source of my interest in water, and eventually this book, to an article about how water had caused my town to be green. It was a stimulating intellectual exercise. But there was a visceral element to it all that emerged as I began spending time by a stream, specifically the stream that links the two reservoirs that I previously mentioned. I just sat there and watched it, thought about what had happened in that stream over these, time, over these years, and what might happen to it in the future. There's likely a stream or a river or a pond that you pass every day. So many times you pass it, you don't even see it anymore. And if you were to pull the car to the side one day and just stop and look at it and ask some questions about where is this water coming from, where is it headed, what's in it, how to get in it, what's going to happen to it in the future, wondering about the effect of what we do to water. Well, if that meditation leads you to greater awareness or to action, well, then I think this book will be a success. So, thank you very much. I'd be happy to hear your questions. And also, I'd like to hear you talk about your own experiences around water. I'm here to learn as well. Thank you.
Yes. I'm sorry, uh, I missed it, but the two reservoirs you were just referring to that caused you some contemplation? Well, they are Woodard Pond okay. and Babbage Reservoir. These are two reservoirs in the town of Roxbury. The first one, Woodard Pond, was built in 1886. And the growing demands of the city of Keene uh, in 1931 led to the construction of Babbage Reservoir. These two are connected. Yes? I was, well, beautifully told story. Thank you. Uh -huh. uh, the 1939 uh, reticence to allow the federal government in is fascinating to me. And it sounds, it, 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 it harkens to states' rights arguments that we heard in the South a decade later. Exactly. And, yeah, can you give, well, give a little more detail on that? Um, well, there is the thought. I mean, that we have our country, our history of our country is tension between <clears throat> the states and the center. And we, 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 were, we, were, we grew up thinking that the only people who argue about states' rights are people in the, white people in the South. Um, and so I was as surprised as you were and interested as you are in what happened here. And um, certainly Mr. Roosevelt had a good idea. He'd seen a successful enterprise in the TVA. One thing that perhaps he didn't take into account sufficiently was that the TVA dams were built on land that was already owned by the federal government to a large extent, where up here it was private land. And that's a subject that really uh, helps distinguish water in New England and, 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 and our ec economics in New England from other parts of the country. And that is, our economic development is based on the use of private property by individual citizens, whereas in many other parts of the country, that's not been the case. I'm talking 19th century, early 20th century. There's an excellent piece on the particular subject of the comprehensive development of the Connecticut River, that is to say, this um, matter involving the, the dam, the plan for dams. And I can refer you to that particular document. It's a uh, written, it appeared in an obscure journal that I came upon, and I was able to talk with the authors of it. And it's a fascinating subject. So I hope I've answered your question. Okay. Yes. Um, I have a question uh, back to technology, new technologies for how we use and improve water. And that has to do with ponds and lakes in Vermont. There are some, um, I don't know how new they are, but efforts to use aeration technology at the base of ponds and lakes that um, have become heavily silted, sometimes with a lot of growth of uh, plants and so on. And kind of filling in, and I'm wondering if that was one of the technologies outside the household that you might have come to. I, didn't, I did not make a study of that particular science, but that this is uh, a field of tremendous activity, that is to say water technology. Um, you can find it in the methods of hydro, hydropower, um, you can find it in the ways to deal with uh, invasive species such as Eurasian milfoil. Uh, you can find it in, in this particular case right here, trying to deal with solutions to the to silting problems. Um, my, I, I take a little liberty in the book on a part on technology in which I um, shamelessly uh, uh, put some a new uh, uh, I revived the script in the, the movie The Graduate in which Dustin Hoffman is advised that the, the future is in plastics. Uh, in fact, the future is in water. That's right. Send your child to study water technology, you'll be doing fine. Yes? Did your research take you in uh, or much into the state of Maine? Yes, it did. Uh, How far north, north did you go? Well, I went to uh, the Presumpscot River. Um, I went to York, which is in the south. Um, I did not go to the far north. 
you go to the Penobscot River? Yes. You do? So, yeah. Just, and, but that has to do with um, the subject of uh, the restoration of fish migrations or the attempted restoration of fish migrations. Why? Do you have an experience there? Well, uh, our whole family was supported off the large paper mill called the Great Northern Paper Company, uh, which was located in Millinocket, in East Millinocket, Maine. And it's right on the east and the west branches of the Penobscot River. And some of that money that put me through college was pulling the wood that would come down in, in, in booms down the Penobscot River. Uh, that, to a large extent, there'd been a lot of stripping of the land on both sides of the Penobscot at that time. And the, the condition of the water when it reached us, uh, pulling wood into the wood room and then the grinder room at the paper companies, it was just atrocious. But it wasn't as bad as the water that exited the paper mill into what was called the Millinocket Stream. To look at that would make you almost sick because of the colors and the contents of it. And I just wonder, you know, if that had been looked at. Well, um, I, I don't get in, into detail on wood processing. There is mention made of what textile, textile manufacturers, what they do to water. You can determine you know, downstream of a mill, what colors they're using today. <clears throat> I think the, the most significant uh, pollution problems that I, that I came upon um, uh, throughout New England was uh, related to, sewage, to the releases of sewage. Um, but there are plenty of uh, fellow uh, contaminants that get into the water. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Uh, well, I'm from the South, uh, Brooklyn, North Carolina, and one of the great legacies in the area that I grew up was the um, TBA. And my family uh, had direct experience with that working uh, in the TBA project back in the uh, 30s. And I was wondering, there's this juxtaposition that comes up when you talk about the governors of Vermont and you have to say, you know, keep your hands out of our area. The, the uh, conflict and the resolution that needs to be, or the balance between the rights of the individual versus the rights of the community. And it concerns me greatly uh, when it comes to the water uh, and who has the right to water. Do people downstream have just as much right to that water as people uh, who have property where the water passes through? Uh, and this is a big issue out west, of course, especially relating to the Arizona River and the, uh, the water conservation, the use of water in Los Angeles, for instance, uh, from the land and the water coming out of the Grand Canyon. So do you have any comments about that or any insights into how, and the Supreme Court, are there any Supreme Court acts relating to uh, the needs of the community for water versus the needs of an individual to control the water? Well, there are. There are plenty of, there are a lot of lawsuits and a lot of court decisions on this particular subject. Um, there is one decision from 1931 that, in which the, 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 the state of Massachusetts had planned to draw some water from the Connecticut River and get it into uh, a reservoir so you could send pipe it to the people, good people of Boston. And uh, Connecticut was not, all this was not all happy with that particular plan and brought an action and the court ruling was um, somewhat sympathetic, but not entirely so. And essentially said, Connecticut, you're, been, you're providing speculation as to how you'll be damaged. Let's see some real damage before we, we, we rule in your favor. But there's always competition uh, between people who are upstream and downstream. Um, the, one of the most significant, an excellent book on the subject of, uh, of uh, on, touching on this subject is called Nature Inc. Nature Incorporated, and it's about uh, uh, the use of um, uh, conflicts over water, uh, largely in the Merrimack River in, in, in the eastern part of New Hampshire, where um, the mills in Lowell and, and, and further south in, in Massachusetts and in New Hampshire were buying up and buying up waters or building dams up by Winnipesaukee and other places.
so they could store their water there. And um, there were some farmers who were quite upset with that who uh, got uh, violent and uh, went after dams with picks and, and hammers. So the, 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 our, our, our history is rich with contention over water. It's going to get worse, I guess is what I would say. What's that? Uh, water is very, uh, like you said, water is the future, and the use of water uh, and the preservation of water, clean water, is going to be a major conflict point, especially uh, in the future between areas that have the water and areas that don't have the water. That's correct. Especially That's correct. big cities and rural communities. That's right. And so there was a time in the, uh, uh, in the 1960s when the state of Massachusetts, in fact, did plan. It, 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 it made some significant uh, planning to draw from the Connecticut River to send the water to Boston. And its principal opposition at that time was not the state of Connecticut. It was people who lived in Northampton and Greenfield and such uh, who said, you city folks, the reason you need our water, our water, Connecticut River, the reason you need it is, is because you're letting all your water pipes in the city of Boston leak. Fix the leaks first and then come for our water. So there's tensions all over in this particular field. I just wonder how democracy is going to deal with that. You wonder how democracy? Yeah, yep. democracy I think uh, the, the majority rules. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, good. Okay.